Hi everyone, I hope you're doing really well and welcome to the fourth video in this series on a recipe for extremely reproducible enrichment analysis. Just recall in the last video we built a custom Docker image for our project and that project was to look at gene expression differences due to the knockdown of the set seven methyl transferase and that data is available on NCBI Geo and we're going to be uh, analyzing that in the this video. Uh, and in it, we are going to build, or we're going to customize the R Markdown script um, for that set seven knockdown project. Um, and so, yeah, we're going to get started now. The first step being to launch that uh, Docker image that we made into a container. Uh, and that is an R Studio based um, uh, container. And we're going to uh, initiate it with this. Uh, command here, docker run, um, and then it's got the port forwarding here, 8787, and then the password for the RStudio user. So we are going to put that in, and then the image that is going to run the docker service with the RStudio, so that we should be able to enter that here. Studio is the user and BioC is the password. And we'll be greeted with the regular RStudio windows. But you'll see that in the home directory here, there's nothing. Uh, and that's because all of the stuff that we uh, had made is in the um, kind of in the root directory. Uh, so we will, uh, I'll actually show you guys CD slash set seven, um, it's all here. And this has permissions of the root user. So it's probably not a good idea for us to be working there. It would be much better for us to copy that into the user's home, the RStudio user's home directory, and then um, work in that directory. So let's, uh, let's go back a little bit. Let's go uh, CD to our home directory and copy that set seven KD folder into our home directory. I guess we can do it this way. Um, and then we can see that we're in that directory now and the permissions are RStudio so that we can, uh, you know, make modifications to these uh, items here. Uh, and what we'll do is also um, set the working directory for set seven, there it is, and there we go. Um, and you'll notice that there's a bit of a mismatch here. The, paint, the files pane thinks we're still in the home directory. So I can click on that go to working directory um, button, and then that brings up all of that good stuff right there. So um, the next step in our task is to grab ourselves the template, our markdown script. Uh, and to do that, I'll use the shell. Uh, I'll use the wget command. So I just paste in that there. Um, and that's going to fetch that example.rmd. And what I'd like to do is rename that from example to set seven KD for knockdown, but RMD. Uh, and so the next step um, will be to start to open that file and then we'll work systematically from the top just to customize it for the specific purpose that we want to do. Um, and best way to do this, this is to open it up in the editor uh, so that we get that uh, there. Uh, and yeah, we'll, I'll make this a bit bigger so everyone can see clearly what's going on. And yeah, we start uh, modifying this with the title. So um, analysis of the effects of set seven. Okay, 
that's okay. Um, and I'll change the author to be just me for this one. I'll keep all of these other options the same. Uh, you can obviously change it to your liking. I'll just explain what's going on here. Uh, we can define the output as a HTML document. HTML documents are great because you get some of the benefits of interactive tables, interactive charts, that sort of thing. And you can have a table of contents that's kind of floating on the side of the, the page, which allows easier navigation. And also uh, code can be kind of hidden away uh, and selectively unhidden. Uh, whereas for a PDF, um, it, you don't have these um, benefits. Uh, and here I've just set the figure width and height to relatively small. Uh, and the theme is a really basic theme called Cosmo, but feel free to, to change that to whatever you like. Um, I always like to have the source at the, yeah, so before I jump into what the rest of the stuff here, um, all of this material between these three dashes is the header, and that has a very strict uh, format. And uh, these aren't the only uh, options that you can use. There's many more, but I'd recommend you just keep it as it is uh, for the first iteration and then uh, change it once you have a working script. Um, and then afterwards, after this um, three, three dashes, we have some plain text, uh, and this will appear as, yeah, in as text that can be kind of background or introduction explanation. And I like to begin it with um, where the source uh, can be found so that people can see, um, you know, the code that, that is behind all of it without, um, yeah, uh, in the context of the repository. Uh, and this one is set 7KD uh, there. Uh, in the next line here, we've got the subheading. So I like to have subheadings for things like introduction and, um, you know, loading the data, quality control, all of those sort of things, and then conclusions at the end. Um, this is really up to you how much introduction you want to to do, but um, I'll just write something really short and generic just for this demonstration. Uh, I'll, I'll say um, um, set server knockdown using RML seek um, data and from I'll say uh, out data. And from GM exception. Let's, let's give a bit of background information to help the reader understand where this is all coming from. All right, so um, next here we have an example of a code chunk. And one of the first things that I like to do in my R markdowns is to define all of the libraries that we need. And I think we do need all of these except for this get DEE2 package, which was used to fetch the data in the original script. Now we're just kind of in, um, directly downloading it from Geo, so we can skip that one. But we'll keep all of the others because they're quite handy for analysis and displaying tables, enrichment analysis, enrichment analysis, uh, Euler diagrams, and heat maps. So we'll keep those ones there. Um, da, 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 da. So this background doesn't apply to us. Uh, count that now the fetch from CBI, geo, and then we can provide the URL brackets, something like that. Okay. So you'll see that for each of these chunks, um, we provide a little r for the engine or the language that we're using. And you can actually use a variety of different languages as long as they're installed on the system, like uh, Bash, Shell, uh, Python, R, and there's a few others. Uh, and I also like to provide the name of the chunk. And this allows us to better troubleshoot later on if we're having issues and none of the chunks have names, then uh, it gets um, 
yeah, it can be a bit of a pain. So what um, I like to do is have yeah specific names for what is going on. All right, so with this one, we are going to download these counts. I think we'll get the counts here. And we'll use maybe one command to define the URL. And then we'll do download.file URL best file equals, and we'll use the original file extension. There. Um, so yeah, we can run those commands as we are working and we should probably load these libraries in as well. Okay. So I can see that the counts have been downloaded. Let's see if we can, um, okay, those packages loaded in fine. Took a while though. Read dot uh, table, and we'll see if we can just load in the counts into an object called X. Um, and we'll immediately inspect that X object to make sure it's okay. So we've got uh, the row names have appeared properly and the, the data appears properly. Um, just to make sure we've got, yep. And the samples are named non-target control one, set seven, knockdown one, and three replicates of that. Um, and what I will also do is look at the tail because I think by recollection, there is a, a entry in this which contains all of the reads that weren't assigned to genes, and that's called not in bed. Um, so what I will do is get rid of that, uh, so that we're just looking at the the genes and nothing else, no kind of goofy uh, data points. So row names x not equals to Bend. and we use the square bracket method to subset that. And before I do, I'll just check the dimensions. Uh, 18,000. We'll do the selection of the row names. Yep, and so we've dropped one of those uh, rows, which is good. And if we run the tail again, that's now gone. What you'll also notice is that in our gene names, we've got um, the ID and then an underscore and then the gene symbol. And for this pipeline to be compatible, we need to change this first, uh, this underscore. So let's do that straight away. Uh, by uh, using the sub command, so sub, uh, the thing that you want to change and then what you want to change it to, we're going to change it to a space and the data that we want to change, which is row names of X. Um, yep, that's okay. And we want to substitute this back as row names of X. There we go. So when we do x again, uh, we should see that the underscore has changed. Okay, so that's really good. Um, what we should also probably do in this um, uh, here is to set up a sample sheet. So what the sample sheet looked like previously was just the row names uh, of the, the names of the samples. Uh, and then whether it was in the treatment group or in the control group. So what we can do is use basically the, the headings from the count matrix to, to initiate 
that sample sheet. So I can do call names x um, and make that uh, as dot data dot framing. I'm pretty sure that will work. Uh, and we'll call this SS for sample sheet. Now when we have a look at this, uh, there we go, it's just uh, that there. <clears throat> um, and what we want to do is uh, define NTC as the control and set seven knockdown KD1 as, or it set seven KD as the treatment group. Um, so let's get rid of some of this stuff so we can see the results down there. Um, uh, I think it's grep or grepl. I'm not too sure, but uh, we will do this. Uh, Seven KD and let's see what this gives us. Search seven, not search seven, set seven. Um, that's not quite what we wanted. Repel. False true, false true. Okay, that's fine, but we might want to change it to as dot um, numeric, perhaps. And then maybe as dot, um, I don't know, we'll just leave it as, as numeric. I think it will get converted to factors by DUSeq anyway. So uh, we want to save this as SS dollar treatment. I think that's what we had previously. So let's see what SS looks like. There we go. And I think that's. That's fine for us, for our purposes. Sample sheet four, set seven down. And that reminds me, this is in endothelial cells. So I might um, just put that in the introduction. Um, All right, cool. Uh, can clean up some of this, but it's fine. Uh, yeah, that's fine. So we're using cable here to generate a nice cable. I wonder if that will come up nicely. There we go. That's fine. Uh, the next step is data quality control. Um, and yeah, there's a range of different quality control measures, but here we're just looking at the number of reads as a really rough um, indication of whether the data is good or not. Uh, the data set we're looking at is called X. So we can run this and we can see the number of reads per sample is around 15 million to 20 million, something like that. That's not too bad. Uh, now we can make an MDS plot. Uh, keeping in mind that our object is called X and not MX. I'm just looking for any other cases of MX. Yep. Mm, yep. Let's have a look. All right, there we go. MDS pot looks pretty good. Um, the only only thing I don't like about this um, chart is that it's kind of squished the MDS plot. Um, but uh, when that whole R markdown is run, it's going to respect these um, yeah, specifications up here. Uh, so it, it will, the final product will look different and will probably look better. Okay, so um, the next part is to actually run the differential expression analysis using DEseq, um, keeping in mind that the data set is now called X. And that's a little bit annoying that I've got to change all of those, but that's okay. Uh, in this um, line here, we're removing any uh, genes that have less than 10 reads per sample on average. It's the rule of thumb that I use throughout my research. It tends to work okay. Um, I prefer it over uh, reads per million based uh, filtering that I've seen other folks use, but I guess both are okay. Uh, so let's see how many 
um, rows we've lost. We've actually lost no rows probably because that uh, those counts have already been pre-filtered on Geo. So that's good. Uh, count matrix, yeah, looks fine to us. Uh, and now here we have the DEC. You can see it's using the SS sheet as the sample sheet and uh, the TRT column, the treatment column. Um, and then, yeah, it's doing some, yeah, this is the full DEC pipeline. And then it adds the normalized counts onto that. And the raw counts, I understand as well. And then uh, we get a table of the top 10 genes. I wonder if we can run all this and have it work for us. Okay, that's going. Yay. Uh, yep, we've got the results. We've got some strong results there, and they look uh, consistent with what I've seen before. So that's great. All right, so now we're going to move on and do some of the visualizations. The first one is a smear plot. It's also called an MA plot. Um, and I'm just going to watch out for any instance of MX and change that. I wonder if I can do that. Okay, it doesn't turn up that much. Oh, we're back to where we were. Sorry for all the scrolling. Um, that looks like there's no other instance of MX. So we'll just run this. Uh, I want to change the, that subheading. That's not, um, we'll call this seven KD. Yep, I'll just make sure the previous one is done as well. Top three genes for seven KD. Sometimes we forget these things. Um, MDS port, that's generic. That's fine. All right, let's try this smear plot again. Yay, that's great. All right, so um, that is the differential expression results that I was expecting. And we're going to move on now with enrichment analysis using an overrepresentation test. Um, and for each of these overrepresentation tests, I think it's a good idea to include a reporting checklist. So that's these ones here. Um, so we're going to have a look at the origin of the gene sets. And uh, here I'm looking at reactome from the 30th of June. So I will modify this. 0603, tool used, uh, cost profiler. And the version is going to be reported at the end with the session info, statistical test. Um, hypergeometric test, p-value correction, FDR, background list, genes with 10 reads per sample. So using that same threshold as I mentioned before, gene selection criteria, DEC, FDR 0.05, um, directionality of the test. We're going to run separate tests for up and down regulated genes. Some folks like to combine up and down into one test, and I feel like that's not very good because the the functions of up and down regulated genes tend to be very different. Um, and I feel like if you combine them, you actually dilute the effects of both. Um, so I use separate tests. Uh, data availability, it was via the DEE2 website. Now it's going to be um, from Geo session. Yeah. Other parameters, um, a minimum gene set size of 10, but I guess five could be okay if you wanted to use that. Um, and the next part is to load the gene sets in R. And uh, in the previous analysis, they were in the slash ref folder, but um, here they're just in the, the project directory there and we will load them in. 
um, directly. Yep, uh, this is where they were originally obtained from. And I've just given them a different name based on the based on the date that they were uh, downloaded. Uh, I don't know. I can use tab completion. That's pretty handy. Uh, and you're probably wondering why I'm loading it in twice. Uh, it's because Cluster Profiler and the other tool we're using, FGSEA, they have a different format for how they like their gene sets to be presented in Cluster Profiler. They are a two-column table. Um, yeah, this one here, you can see two variables. Uh, and this one here, G sets, that's for FGSEA. It's a large list. So each um, pathway is a separate um, uh, vector. And there's, yeah, two and a half thousand such uh, vectors in that list. All right, so moving on, um, what we're going to do is filter the gene names into three lists up down regulated and also the background the background is simply all genes that were detected so i'm pretty sure all of this is going to work um if we just run it so let's give it that a go uh, and it's told us how many genes are in the background that's everything that was detected up and down regulated the number of genes in the background is not the exact number of rows of our differential expression set. It's because there's a small number of genes that have the same gene symbol. I'm not sure why that's the case, but um, yeah, that's how it is. Okay. Uh, also, one of the funny things that I found about Cluster Profile is that um, it doesn't really respect what the user defines as the background. Um, basically, if um, that gene is not mentioned in the gene set in the pathway list, then it kind of just gets discarded. And I don't like that behavior. The way to fix it is to add uh, a new gene set, which consists of all genes that were detected. And that just ensures that none of our genes get discarded in the process. So this is the workaround that we're going to use. Um, okay, so now we're going to do upregulated genes. And yeah, we should get the 18,000 in the BG ratio. Uh, I'll show you what that looks like. Um, also notice that this maximum gene set size, I've made it really big because we um, are doing this workaround. Um, yeah, if, if it was the default, then I think it wouldn't, the workaround wouldn't work. Uh, we're providing the background list and this uh, amended gene sets object. So yeah, turn pathways. Okay, um, top upregulated pathways in set seven down. All right, let's see whether this chunk works. Yep, that's okay. Yep, so 18,000 in the background. That's good. And we've got quite a few results here, which is very nice. Now the down-regulated genes. Um, let's change this. Again. And that. <laughs> okay, all good. Yeah, lots of strong results there. Interference signaling is a good one. All right, um, here we're gonna make a bar plot. So uh, basically taking the top up regulated gene sets, top down regulated gene sets, and then making a bar plot out of them. It's all pretty simple stuff, but it gives a nice overview of the results that we found. I know other folks like to make a bubble plot and all that stuff. Yeah, if you feel like doing that, that's great. I just like to keep things very simple. And that's the um, overrepresentation test done and dusted. We'll move on now with uh, functional class scoring. And so this is you know, the GSEA family of methods where instead of just providing a short list of the genes of interest, we look at you know, the full um, list of genes that were detected and their differential expression. So um, again, we've got one of these um, checklists and I'm going to 
uh, fill it out as best I can. The tool used is FGSEA. Um, the statistical test is the Komkomorov Smirnov test. Uh, P value correction with FDR again. Um, yeah, background list. Now it's not really a background list, but detection threshold. So any gene that has less than this number of reads per sample on average across all samples would be kind of eliminated from the analysis as irrelevant. Uh, gene selection criteria, we're actually not, um, not doing any gene selection because the way functional class scoring works is that it takes the full list of genes. So this is not applicable for this um, analysis. Directionality, so we're not, um, so uh, again, this test uh, does not really apply because yeah, we're testing both directions in one test. Testing both directions in one analysis. I think is the right way to put it. Data availability again. And then the session number, other parameters, min gene set, set size of 10 is fine again. So uh, I think this will, this is the FGSEA code. Um, and I'm pretty sure it will just work. So I'll hit run and then I might pause the recording because it'll take a few seconds to run. Hey, that finished after a, a few seconds. Uh, and we've got the results. And FGSEA res, there we are. Uh, there it is. That's all of our uh, results there. That's looking pretty good. And they should be ordered by p value. Let's see. Yes, they are. The significant ones above. That's perfectly fine. Uh, let's move on with the next part, which is. Um, you know, passing the results, uh, filtering, identifying the up and down regulated pathways using the FDR of 0.05. There's just a few minor things to change. Let's see if that works. Yep, that's all fine. There we get out this top table list. And again, a bar plot. There's not much to change here. We just get the results. Uh, red means upregulated and down, uh, blue means downregulated. And now we can compare the results of the overrepresentation test and the uh, functional class scoring tests. Let's see what that looks like, uh, da, da. yep, so this is upregulated genes, there's a big overlap between the two analyses, and for downregulated genes, that overlap is not as, not as large as you might expect, uh, and just to, to um, kind of give an overall picture, we can calculate the Jacquard, um, Jacquard index for these two analyses, being 54%, that's relatively good. Um, and here we've got an example of a couple of different uh, visualizations you can do. Firstly, we can visualize some of these FGSEA results with enrichment plots. There we go. So there's an example of an upregulated gene set and a downregulated gene set. Uh, and next we've got heat maps of up and down regulated gene sets. There is that. Change that MX to just X and now we'll do that again. Um, hopefully it will work now. Yeah, there we go. So uh, an up regulated pathway and a down regulated pathway. There we go, a bit of vari variability there, but I think it's doing the right job. And then we have session info, and this will have all of the, um, the version information that we want to report 
All right. So as you can see, it looks like all of the code works, but um, we really do need to see whether the whole thing uh, works in totality by knitting it. So I'm going to do that now. Um, we need an opt-out. Do you want to install? Okay, what I might do is pause the video. Okay, so I've just uh, installed that one package there with um, that was required. And now we can hit uh, knit and it's now executing the full pathway, the full workflow. Um, and that's going to take a couple of minutes. I don't think there'll be any problems. So I'll see you in a second. Okay, so the script has just completed and I've got this pop-up uh, showing me the results of it. And uh, yeah, it looks like everything's worked nicely. Um, yeah, you can see that the aspect ratio is again, five by five, uh, which was what I expected. And uh, we've got all of the visualizations, the bar charts there look okay. Um, those di these Euler diagrams look a bit big, but that's it's fine for me. Um, and yeah, session info, we just click on that to bring it up. So that all looks fine to me. Um, so now the next step is really to to fetch out that that script that we've been working on and then add it to the the GitHub repository. Uh, so to do that, what I think we can do is just um, uh, close that uh, studio server. Don't worry, we're not going to lose anything. Close the, uh, stop the Docker uh, service. Uh, and what we'll do is to run the Docker copy command. Hopefully we can remember where it all is. Um, and we're going to copy the set seven KD folder and the name of the workflow is also set seven KD in lower case. Um, and what this command is doing is it's looking in the most latest um, uh, Docker image. So if I just run this command here by itself, it gives us the uh, code of that um, uh, Docker container. Uh, so we're copying that uh, script out of the Docker container. It looks like it's done it. And there it is here. So if we were to just have a look at the head of that, we can see it's exactly what we were working on a few moments ago. So that looks uh, fantastic. And um, what I'll do is stop the video here uh, and continue in the next video on all of the further stuff to finish things off. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you in the next one.